Paper Players Podcast. I'm Freestyle. Thank you so much for joining me. If this is your first time joining me, the philosophy of this podcast is to speak to the players who are shaping the metagame so that their voices can be heard. This week's voice? Well, a recurring one. Hellsock came on in one of the earliest iterations of the podcast when I still had very much to learn. And since then, he has regularly done well in the challenge. Where most of the podcasts I've done start with having the guest introduce themselves, he's very much already done that. And he's already taken some strong opinionated stances on the format health of Popper, as well as some card selection choices that players prefer. So if you're not familiar with the previous episode, I do encourage you to go back and check that out before continuing with this one, simply because if this is your first time joining me, you're probably not that familiar with a man who has been shaping the Popper metagame for as long as I've been playing it. And something else that occurs to me is that in addition to metagames that are shaped, so is the language of the game. And in the same way that Dark Kofnot became Bob, well, Kelsa will ask you to consider calling Bonders Ornament Bonkers Ornament. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me. It's been a while. Thanks, man. I'm glad to be back, and I'm glad to talk about our favorite format. Speaking of this format, I always start off the podcast with talking about people shaping the metagame. It occurs to me that in the past month, you've done a lot of that. Could you give us just sort of a, a breakdown on this heater that you've been on? I started off by winning the May 3rd challenge with Tron, of course. Tron is the best deck. I'm always going to keep playing it. Then I got second in the Saturday challenge the next week, and I top aided the Sunday challenge of the week after that. I also won the May 23rd challenge. I top forward the May 30th challenge, and I just now won the Sunday challenge. All of these challenges played with Tron. And uh, just before the May 30th challenge, a new card entered our format, which greatly changed it, probably for the worse, but we'll get into that. Bonder's Ornament has made Tron a lot better for reasons we'll get into, but it also has helped me win a lot more games. So I, th I can credit Bonder's Ornament with... Uh, some of my recent success, but I did win two challenges before it entered the format, so I think uh, Tron was already very good, and Bonder's Ornament simply just makes it better. And it's definitely in a position to benefit from it most, although it's not going to be the only deck playing Bonder's Ornament. The card is already seeing play in Black White Pestilence, the more controlling builds. I've also seen it in Boros Monarch. It's going to wind up becoming a staple for the duration of its legality, whether that's till the end of Popper's existence or just for a shorter time period, you know, it's really just up to speculation that. However, while it remains legal, it's going to see a lot of play as a colorless card. It's not bound to the same deck building restrictions as, say, Ephemerate, something else of that power level. But Tron has the mana to make the most of this, as well as needing the color fixing more than the other deck. I can't think of a card better slotted to fit into existing Tron shells, but what did you cut to make room for it? I had to cut a couple ephemerate targets, so my Seagate Oracles are gone. I also cut uh, one of the anti-combat cards from the main deck, and I cut my random impulse that I was running. Um, I'm also not running an exclude. I'm not sure which of these cards I cut specifically for Bonders Ornaments, but I have enjoyed the fact that Bonders Ornament by itself is a source of card advantage, so I don't need to run Seagate Oracles to have targets for my Ephemerates. I don't need to run Impulses as something to grab off of Teachings if I just need to find more gas. Bonders Ornament takes care of that, and I think... Going back to those other Bonders Ornament decks, what they all have in common is 
they are weak against Tron, which means if Bonner's Ornament is very good, and it seems like it's quite good in a variety of decks, Tron will be the best Bonder's Ornament deck because it'll have an advantage over the non-Tron Bonder's Ornament decks. Simply by relying on it less and leveraging the mana advantage? The mana advantage is basically the, the killer. Tron already had an advantage over, say, blue-black teachings simply because Tron has tons more mana. This will play out in the same way against the other grindy decks. If Tron and the grindy deck is both playing at the same game plan, but Tron gets to cast twice or three times as many spells, or gets to activate ornament a whole bunch while still developing, that leads Tron to have an advantage of just brute forcing their way through whatever the opponent's trying to do. It's kind of an antiquated example, so just quick shout out to anyone still playing Blue Black Teachings in 2020. You're you're a brave soul, and uh, you know I've I've played against one last year. I only played. They still exist. Yeah, they they definitely do exist. Last year, I had the opportunity to play some Grand Prix side events at both Grand Prix Denver and Grand Prix Oklahoma City, and I did encounter a 150 card Teachings player. It's kind of obvious what he was on as soon as he rolled up with what looked like a commander deck. And I joked with him at first. It's like, is that your popper deck or do you, you have your commander deck on the table? And he's like, oh, it's my, my popper deck. I'm like, oh, geez, I wonder what you're playing. So, yeah, I mean, they do they do exist. They, they are out there. Just, you know, a quick shout out to anyone still grinding it out with the 150 card blue black teachings. And while Tron may have the mana advantage, you definitely have the deck size advantage. Oh, definitely. You can play so many cards, and on Magic Online, you don't even have to shuffle them up. That just sounds like winning to me. That does sound like winning. But I like to play Tron because I like actually winning, not just sounding like winning. What would it take for you to play Slivers in a challenge? Mm, uh, if I have to double Q. That's about it. You say hit the word have. Like, if the Slivers and I travel to you, and we put a gun against your head, and we're like, double Q, Hellsaw. You're like, all right, I guess I'll play Slivers. Yeah, that sounds about right. I'll see you Sunday. <laughs> see you soon. <laughs> Probably not so much with a, with the most likely outcome being travel restrictions in the near future. Probably probably not going to be coming and forcing you to play Slivers. I think that it's just funny. It w it's probably the same if I were to be forced to play Tron. It's just not something I want to do, right? It's just, it doesn't interest me. It just doesn't interest me. Um, like, I get it. It's strong. It's good. I have played Tron, and I've experienced the power, but it's just not me. You know what I mean? It's like one of those things where a lot of people like the UFC. I, I don't. I think the UFC is boring. Dudes just beat each other up. I could go to the bar and see a more interesting fight, because those dudes will play dirty uh, and be drunk. That That is strange. You like slivers, but you don't like just watching people get beat up? That's basically all slivers do, is just beat up the opponent. Yeah, I mean, I have no words for... Okay, so I'm not a creature of logic. All right, there we go. We figured it out. Um, we're supposed to be Plato and Socrates. They claimed we were, but I clearly am not. So, but yeah, I mean, it's not... Tron's not my cup of tea, so... Help me understand some of these card selection choices. I do feel like I intuitively grasp them, but it seems like the deck list has changed a bit since your May 3rd win to your June 14th win. What have you changed in that time period other than just those slots for Bonders Ornament? Some of these slots also had to get adapted because of the addition of Bonders Ornament. A lot of it is just metagame decisions. I used to play a main deck, Electricery, which allowed me to kill fairies, kill turn one delvers, um, wipe the field against elves, or just kill a one toughness creature to buy me a turn. Instead, I'm running a Suffocating Fumes, a new card from Ikoria, to black, instant, all your, creature, your opponent's creatures get minus one, minus one until end of turn, and it has Cycling too. So if I'm playing against the mirror, I can just pay two mana, get rid of it, try to get in a better card. Or uh, even against some Delver decks, once they flip the Delver or if they've got a couple ninjas and their fairies don't matter anymore, you can just cycle the fumes and it seems like a pretty good card. Uh, just get yourself a retraw rather than maybe deal one damage and trade with a ni or, or kill in a ninja that you blocked with a stone horn. Ally Trickery doesn't always remain live against the Delver decks, so Fumes is worse early game, 
but it is better late game. And with the addition of Bonder's Ornament, I think that's actually fine. Which is strange to say, given Bonder's Ornament looks like a late game card, but in Tron, because of the mana advantage, sometimes you just need to be able to do stuff um, at a rapid pace, and the fumes being able to cycle allows you to just filter to find what you need when fumes isn't dead. And when fumes is still alive, you just cast that guy. Um, I'm also playing a main deck last breath, one in a white for an instant, exile target creature with power two or less, and it's a its controller gains four life. Um, this is to kill small creatures, delvers, ninjas, fairies, whatever elf the opponent's got, a seeker of the way on your turn, maybe a glint hawk or a core sky fisher, or an opposing mnemonic wall or mole drifter, or an opposing familiar, or an axe bane guardian, or an axe bane guardian. It has a lot of uh, utility, and sometimes you just pay a one and a white, kill a creature, buy yourself a turn. It's earned its keep. With the addition of those two cards, I'm only on five anti-combat cards in the main deck. One Moment's Peace and four Stonehorn Dignitaries. Stonehorn is still awesome. Moment's Peace is good, but not great. We've got five anti-combat cards, plus the Fumes in Last Breath, which hopefully will buy me enough time against Stompy or Slivers so that I can find an actual Fog effect to stop combat forever. I'm also only running uh, th uh, three counter spells, one condescend, one counter spell, and one prohibit. I'm not running the exclude anymore, and I'm only running one prohibit. Counter spell seems kind of ambitious, but with Bonders Ornament, it's easily castable. I've had no real issues with it, and having an actual counter spell gives you the way to counter a gray merchant against mono black that exclude provided uh, ways to counter mole drifters from the opponent. It's been very good. And given a bonders ornament, I don't really need the cantrip off of exclude as badly. And I'm down to three flicker effects, one ephemerate and two ghostly flickers, because I'm only running 13 creatures. I don't have any Seagate oracles. So if I have multiple ephemerates rotting in my hand and I can never find a target, that is one way to die, and cutting the ephemerate and keeping two flickers means I'll hopefully be able to find some targets for the flicker uh, by the time I need to actually run it out there. One ephemerate is kind of a bummer, because being able to ephemerate a stonehorn really wins a lot of matchups, and being able to ephemerate a mole drifter is actually much more likely now with Bonders Ornament. It's much easier to get the two-colored mana plus two other mana uh, than it was previously, but having multiple ephemerates riding in the hand is just too much of a, a a weakness for me to justify keeping multiple ephemerates in my list with only 13 creatures. There's definitely a lot there to unpack. I want to back up a bit. Before I back up a bit, I just want to observe that by relying on Bonder's Ornament more, you're allowed to rely on the Flicker Engine less not just for inevitability or card advantage, but sort of just as a main engine for the axis on which this deck operates. The more that you're confident in your Bonder's Ornament, the more confident you are simultaneously in removing the what is usually considered the best cards in this deck, the Flickers themselves, the Ephemerates themselves, as well as some of the targets, although obviously you did cut the weakest links of those targets in the form of Seagate Oracles, as opposed to, you know, trimming down on Mall Drifters, which would have been madness. I want to go back and just, just point out that Last Breath is an interesting inclusion. It definitely stops one of the traditionally feared cards by Tron in the form of Thermo Alchemist. And interestingly enough, as Suffocating Fumes reads creatures your opponents control, Last Breath reads its controller gains for life. Have you been put in a position yet where you've had to Last Breath your own creature to stay alive? I have not to stay alive, but I did Last Breath my lone missionary to go up to 19 against Burn, and then they conceded. So that's basically the same thing. Yeah, it's just a little extra value there. That's pretty interesting. People are always very quick to point out that 
Burn has done traditionally well against Tron. So it's interesting that you have these extra layers, right, to fight them on, including in the main deck now. Also in the main deck now, that Counterspell. The last time that we saw Counterspell on Tron was during the Astrolabe era because the mana was just that good. I mean, everybody had perfect mana all the time. Why wouldn't you play Counterspell on Tron? Is Bondner's Ornaments, you, you trust it that much. It's, it's basically that, I don't want to say the same level as Astrolabe, because Astrolabe, well, maybe I do. Is this sort of, in some ways, the next Astrolabe? Do, do all decks need this? And No, it, it's, not the same. it's not the same as Astrolabe, because Astrolabe is much better in a wider variety of decks. One mana artifact, draw a card, would be a very powerful card in Popper, and Astrolabe was that, plus a mana fixer. The cost of Astrolabe was running Snow Basics. So in Tron, you would run several islands. Back then, since you're running islands anyway, and you've got all these Astrolabes to fix your mana, Counterspell's pretty good. This is different, because you still have to run non-island lands, so that you can cast Moment's Peace or Stonehorn Dignitary whenever you don't have a prism or an ornament. But I think that ornament is better than Astrolabe in Tron, specifically, because it fixes multiple weaknesses for the deck all at once. Shall we just get into the ornament overall, or are we going to stick on the deck list a little bit? Just as a, as a general observation, comparing Bonner's ornament against Astrolabe, Tron, in my opinion, was probably the worst of the Astrolabe decks. And that, let me rephrase that. Tron benefited Tron benefited the least from Astrolabe of the different decks. And I understand that having extra prophetic prisms is great. It's just really that I'm pointing out sort of the lack of synergy. All the other decks that ran Astrolabe ran stuff that synergized with Astrolabe, whether it was just Scred or whether it was Glinthawk. So... Tron wasn't in a position to benefit the same ways, and the reverse is true now, in that Tron is able to benefit more from Bonder's Ornaments because of the Tron lands, because it's going to be able to activate Bonder's Ornament with amazing frequency and reliability. Um, Tron benefited from Astrolabe because it was another set of Prophetic Prism, and Prophetic Prism was, was the best card in Tron. Other decks benefited from Astrolabe because it was another set of prisms that also cost one mana. So when Tron runs out prism and ornament and then flickers them, that's awesome. They got to play multiple prisms. When Boros, or Jeskai, I guess, at the time, was would run out an Astrolabe and then Glintock it, and then recast the Astrolabe, not only did it get the benefit of being able to run additional prism effects, it also just saved mana. When you prism... Glintock it back and then cast Prism, that's five mana. When you Astrolabe, Glintock it and then Astrolabe, it's three mana. Tron doesn't really get the benefit of the one less cost because you still had to use a colored mana to put into the Astrolabe. And Tron has plenty of colorless mana that it, 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 it would like to use on it instead. I'm just drawing a little bit of a comparison between these two different cards because they seem to be colorless artifacts that fix mana that need to be put into existing decks immediately. And whereas I didn't necessarily recognize the power level of Arkham's Astrolabe, right, if you go back to older episodes of the podcast, I was always saying that, yeah, the card's ubiquitous, and that's an issue, as, you know, it slowly dominated the format and appeared in every single list other than essentially Stompy and Familiars. You know, it's a... it wasn't really about the power of the card. There were more powerful cards in Popper. There still are more powerful cards in Popper than our, our Akron's Astrolabe. It's just that the card was perfect, right? It wasn't about the, the, the it wasn't necessarily about power. It was about perfection. The card was perfect for the formats. Too perfect for the formats. And Bonder's Ornament is different than Astrolabe because Bonder's Ornament is powerful, right? I just I, I want to draw comparisons, but also acknowledge distinctions, essentially. Yes, and there's also the fact that, well, we'll go back to Astrolabe Tron. When you played Astrolabes and Prisms in Tron with a pile of lands to feed them, you would flood out. You're drawing random cards once at one at a time off the top of your library. So if you cantrip five times, 
you are in some cases going to just draw a pile of lands have nothing to do and just die because you drew seven spells and ten lands, but four of those spells were cantrips that they just drew into lands. Bonder's Ornament doesn't have that problem, because if you draw into a bunch of lands with ornament, you just play them, keep activating ornament, and turn after turn after turn, you're just going to get card advantage over and over again. So when you flood out with an, uh, with an Astrolabe, you're just praying off the top of your library to draw a Flicker or a Mole Drifter or a Compulsive Research. When you flood out with Ornament, your only concern is, can I stay alive one more turn to get more cards into my hand with my Ornaments? And that means Tron is extremely capable as long as it can just stay alive. And Tron is really good at staying alive because it plays a pile of moment pieces and Stonehorn dignitaries in order to stay alive. Well, let's not forget that Pulse Marasa. I cannot tell you the number of times where I've been like, all right, I, I have this guy. And then Pulse Marasa, targeting Mall Drifter, cue the Benny Hill music. <laughs> yeah, people who are new to the format always ask, how can Tron possibly beat a Pestilence? And the answer is, Pulse of Marasa targeting Mnemonic Wall. Mnemonic Wall, Pulse of Marasa. Pulse of Marasa targeting Mnemonic Wall. Go. I gain 12 life. I'm at 30. You're at 18. Good luck. Tron, definitely the gold medalist in staying alive. In, in survival. Yeah, perfect Yeah, perfect word choice there. Yeah, definitely the, go, the gold medalist in survival. Now, real quick, before I let you loose on... Bonders ornaments because I know you have a lot to say about Bonders ornament. I want to walk. I want to walk it back to the last time you and I spoke during this run that you've had. How many of your opponents beat you with Relic of Genesis? I think I lost one game. I drew three walls and the pulse, and they had a relic, and I never was able to force them to crack it. And can you compare that with the number of games that your opponents have had Relic of Genesis? I've won more games because of my opponent's relic than I've lost. I've I've demonstrably won games where my opponent cracked a relic early, exiled one of their accumulated knowledges, and then cast three more accumulated knowledges, where if they had not cracked the relic at all, if they had just had a dark steel relic instead, just a completely blank card, they would have drawn three extra cards and likely would have been able to win the game. And there's the games where my opponent plays a turn one relic. And then, even if they don't leave up mana for it, if they just keep playing their threats, they've been denied that extra card. Those games where I may have won or may have lost are hard to actually quantify without knowing exactly what the opponent, what opponent's options were, plus whatever the extra card they would have had would have been. But Relic of Progenitus is very bad uh, against Tron. And I strongly recommend not relying on Graveyard Hate to beat Tron, because it won't work. Juku Bog is free. So anyone out there do want to make that distinction myself is there's a difference between having Bajuku Bogs in your deck because you can just main deck that. They're lands and they have random value. Bajuka Bog is also not free though. Bajuka Bog is not free. Well yeah, it is. It is. Oh well freedom isn't free. It costs folks like you and me. And if we don't all pitch in our buck oh five, who will? <laughs> well, the the I've actually won games because my opponent had Bajuka Bug, three swamps, and they didn't have a four swamp for Defile, so they couldn't actually kill my horror. Uh, I guess I was thinking of like a deck like Monarch. The the card's free because it randomly is great against strands. It's randomly great against a lot of stuff, and it, it's always felt free to me since I picked up Boros Monarch. So, yeah, probably less free in Mono Black because of Defile specifically, followed by Tendrils of Corruption, followed by Actual Corrupt, if you're that guy. And shout out to that guy. They're becoming rare, too. They're, they're along with those 150-card uh, Teachings players. The Mono Black Corrupt Boys are a dying breed. Look, they just need to downshift Murari to be a common, and then we can bring back the uh, the Odyssey Onslaught era mono black control deck in Popper. We're just we're just waiting for for a, for a real bomb in to, to to close the game out. So yeah, you want Murari and Tron then? Is that because you know where that's going? Well, obviously they have to ban Tron first, but we'll we'll get on that. Bog is also not free in Monarch and other decks uh, like White Black uh, because it's a tap land. And if you've got three lands and you're just trying to rip... Yeah, but the decks, our decks are full of those already. And we don't have turn ones. 
really. There's the only turn one play in Boros Monarch is Throb and Inspector. And in certain draws, you cannot afford to play him turn one because you need to return. You need a target for Core Skyfisher, and you've just failed to draw a Prism or anything else that would be better to return to your hand than Throb and Inspector. And your opponent is led with a, a mountain or something like that. So there's just all these scenarios where Bajuka Bong has been on the free side of things. It, it's probably free overall in the metagame, but against Tron, I think you would rather have a basic. Oh yeah, sure, absolutely. Yeah, you want to curve out. Because the games where you have to slam a Monarch on turn four, but you've got three lands, and you're hoping to rip that fourth land, and it's a tap land, those hurt. They, 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 I think that overall, if, if you're only concerned about Tron, you shouldn't play Bajuka Bog. But the other parts of the format help. Right, yeah, I'm not, that's not the stance that I'm taking. I think, in my experience, I feel that Bajuka Bog is free because it's so randomly good against the rest of the field. Just randomly, it, it gets people with removing their tragic lesson from the graveyard, uh, making their Mystic Sanctuaries weaker. Uh, heaven forbid you ever play against Tortex or some other graveyard deck. Yeah, or Cycling Storm or Black Red Reanimator. So it's one thing to run dedicated graveyard hate as a card-like relic. I'm just suggesting that there is a notable exception to the statement that you made that, hey, graveyard hate, just do away with it. You shouldn't even bother. I'm just saying Bajuka Bog, little distinct in... It's being a land. You can just, it's main deckable. You don't have to use cards out of your sideboard for Pachuku Box. Really, all I'm saying is that if you're going to want that effect, well, you know, look into the most free of them. If you're going to play a tap land anyway, you can do worse than Pachuku Box. Yeah, absolutely. But just to be clear, the point that is trying to be made here is that the over reliance on graveyard hate versus Tron does not benefit the popper population yes and the proliferation of graveyard aid also kind of has weird effects on the metagame like cycling storm might be a good deck i i have absolutely no idea because nobody can actually play it through a challenge because 80 percent of their opponents are just going to have like force relic and maybe in the main deck if they're playing against affinity so it's kind of hard to to know and the the entirety of the reasons for people playing so many relics is they're, they are misguided on exactly why you want Graveyard Hate. Bringing in Relic of Progenitus against a Spell Slitter Sprite deck is going to lose you a lot more games than it'll win you when you can turn off their Mystic Sanctuaries, for instance. A very good example that I have in my play history is this lovely screenshot where someone had turn one relic against me when I was playing Slivers, simply because I had blown them out in game two with prismatic strands that they hadn't seen coming because they're not in the main deck, they're just in the sideboard because great card synerg synergizes with Winding Way, improves the burn matchup, amazing in aggro mirrors. Long list of reasons why prismatic strands has earned that slot in the sideboard, but I totally blew this Boris Bully player out of the water because he went all in, and he went big too to like the see how much damage I can do type thing. And I, he he really had a big... He had, he had a lot of uh, dudes coming my way with the, his rally. And I used Prismatic Strands and then calmly cracked back for the win. And his response to that was in Game 3 open on with a turn 1 Relic. Which, as you can imagine, Relic of Pachandis may be not an appropriate card against a deck with 30 creatures. And yes, Tron does run Mnemonic Wall. But believe it or not, Relic of Pachandis is not that appropriate of a sideboard card versus Tron either. And really, anyone out there who feels differently, I do just urge them to consider the philosophy of this podcast where I do go out of my way to speak with people who have earned the distinction of knowing these decks. So just anyone out there who's bringing in Relic against Tron or thinks that Relic is good against Tron, just know that Helsa is literally chuckling when he sees it i do laugh a lot when i see a relic what are some other sort of myths about tron in addition to relic being good against tron what are some other misconceptions people have uh land destruction is not very good against tron like the actual land destruction decks with 16 land destruction effects or 20 land destruction effects their worst matchup is tron 
because Tron just plays tons of mana, tons of ways to get lands, tons of card draw, counter spells, and ghostly flicker. If Tron ever gets to three mana and they ghostly flicker one of your land destruction spells, you have lost. The game is over. You're not coming back from that. And it is very unlikely that you'll draw more land destruction spells than Tron draws lands. So unless you can keep them off Tron, keep them down on mana, and then land a threat, and then keep them down on mana long enough to actually kill them, you're very unlikely to actually win. The ways that land destruction is good is you put down an early clock, and then you choking sands them or molten rain them to deal damage to them, set them back a turn, and keep beating them down with what you played on the first few turns. That's where land destruction is good. If you don't have that ability, the ability to play early threats, pressure their life total, and pressure their mana, then don't bother trying to put in land destruction. Like, if you're playing elves, don't put in thermocarst. If you're playing Stompy, don't put in thermocarst. Uh, if you're playing a Delver deck, don't put in spreading seas. It's not going to help you win more than another card would have. Um, some other way to kill them faster or disrupt them in a different, a different way will be better than a land destruction effect. So I think this is a great opportunity for me to sort of share the process that I have for when I pick up a new popper deck and I've never played it before. What I'll generally do is I will net deck and play a league, two, maybe even three leagues with the net deck 75 before I start making adjustments to that list whether it's for my preferences, play styles, or because I feel that the flex slots need to be adapted for the changes in the metagame from when the list was first published, you know, I do on times find myself picking up someone else's 75. Some of those times, I've had the displeasure of having random land destruction in the sideboard and experiencing this really unfun minigame that occurs where I have to bring in these land destruction spells against Tron because there are so many cards that are ineffective in the main deck. A classic example would be Black White Pestilence has a lot of dead weight in the form of actual dead weight in the main deck versus Tron. And so you take all out all these cards that are ineffective and at the end of the day you have to bring in some additional cards that may not be there for the Tron matchup but should have some value you would think one of those, in this case, being Choking Sands. And I remember not knowing which land to hit and realizing that I had a one out of three chance of being right because if I blew up my opponent's tower and he didn't have another tower, then my spell did something. But if I blew up his tower and he just had another tower in his hand, then my spell had done nothing. I had somehow time-locked the both of us in a way and... It's just not a good look when you have random land destruction in your sideboard against Tron. In addition to all those other reasons that you've pointed out, you do force yourself into a position where you're adding variance into the game by just straight up guessing what the correct target is and hoping that you chose correctly. Because if you didn't, then you're just wasted a turn, essentially. So... Just want to add that to the list of reasons why land destruction isn't the best against Tron. There's not a clear cut target. Whereas if you bring in land destruction against a deck like Black White Pestilence or Boros Monarch, well, you're going to hit the bounce land. That's what it's there for, and it's going to be highly effective when you do. There's a clear cut target. Yeah, I I think that land destruction, if you want it specifically for the bounce land decks, is fine to have in the sideboard. And yeah, you probably should bring it in against Tron, but. Maybe you should consider whether you want land destruction at all. Like, you don't see people just putting in stone rains into their sideboard in other formats, right? Stone rain is fine, but not exactly uh, what you want to be doing, unless that's your actual game plan. Being able to enact your own game plan in Magic is much more powerful than potentially pushing the opponent's game plan back a, a, a few turns. Or maybe one turn or maybe less than a turn, depending on exactly what the situation is. So land destruction and attacking the graveyard, those are misconceptions about Tron. Are there any others that stick out to you? Um, discard is okay, but not great. 
So discard. Uh, discard is okay against Tron when you are looking to take something in particular. For instance, Castigate and uh, Memory Leak, which uh, new card from Ikoria is quite good. Being able to target them and exile a card out of their hand, any card other than land, is much better than a card like Ravenous Wrath or Cry of Contrition or Wrench Mind, where they can choose which cards to discard. Non-targeted effects are not as good against Tron, because they really don't need all of the cards in their hand. If you're a mono black control player and you wrench mine them, and they just discard two anti-combat cards, but they're able to next turn just go Tron Moldrifter, you really didn't accomplish anything. Something like Castigate or Distress or Memory Leak can actually take a, a key card out of their plan. And cards like Duress or Divest, which allows you to look and choose a particular kind of card, can be good enough to stop them, but can also be insufficient. There's a lot of times a Duress on a Tron player misses, just does nothing. And there's a lot of times a Divest isn't able to take the card that matters. When you Duress them, and they've just got a handful of creatures, or you just have you get to take a crappy artifact or, a, or an, un, an unnecessary spell, you traded one for one, and against a deck with Moldrifters, Ponder's Ornaments, uh, Teachings, and Mnemonic Walls, and Compulsive Research to buy back card advantage, you really don't want to be trading one for one. You need to actually be able to disrupt their plan as well. Which, when you go turn one Duress or Divest and are able to take their Bonder's Ornament or Prophetic Prism, and they're going to stumble on colored mana because of that, that's quite good for you. But the times where you draw a discard spell on turn 7, you target them and you blank, that's going to lose you a lot of games. So be careful with your discard. Prefer targeted discard effects, specifically ones that can target any spell uh, so that you don't end up blanking. And try to avoid not playing non-targeted effects like Cry of Contrition or Wrench Mind or whatever, because they don't need all their cards. They're going to outcard you. Wrench Mind seems particularly ineffective against a deck that main decks 12 artifacts. Yeah. Even if some of those artifacts are ones you really want to get rid of, like when they discard a Bonders Ornament to your Wrench Mind, you're probably thinking, hey, excellent. But not if that meant they kept a second Bonders Ornament in hand, or that they kept... Uh, expedition map so that they can get Tron and just start casting Moldrifters. That's not very good. Am I completely mad to think that the card Shenanigans may be well positioned against Tron at this time because of the recurrable nature as the deck starts to rely more on Bonder's Ornaments? The deck already relies on Prophetic Prism to fix its mana, and occasionally... You could get an expedition map. It's not going to be something that happens too frequently. In the case of, you know, you're the deck with shenanigans, you're on the play, land, go, they go, land, map, and then you're like, ha, gotcha. And it's actually relevant as opposed to them already having natural Tron and not even needing the map. So, you know, extra small percentages there against map, but mainly against Bonders, Ornaments, and Prophetic Prism. You, am, I, am, I, am I off my rocker here, or is Shenanigans actually well-suited against Tron at this time? It's not, uh, because it's a sorcery. Um, you have to tap out two mana on your turn, and given the card is red, and if you're playing Shenanigans, they are likely going to bring in Blue Blasts anyway for your other cards. Yeah, but Blue Blast doesn't do anything against Shenanigans. You just dredge and keep doing it stubbornly. Uh, when Tron one for ones for one mana, it's really, really good for Tron. And all they're trying to do is buy time. You're wasting two of your mana, not killing them, to hopefully disrupt their artifacts. There's going to be lots of cases where they don't care. They've got a Cave of Temptation in play. Or they don't care. They have more artifacts to play. Or they don't care. They've got Ghostly Flicker. You've got to have a clock. 
and it seems likely that other cards would be able to disrupt their their plays better than shenanigans. When you blow up a prism or an ornament, you denied them a colored mana source. When you red blast a Moldrifter, you denied them a colored source. They had to use a colored source to play the Moldrifter. But you also denied them a Moldrifter. So you can just play more red blasts instead. Maybe the format is such that you want shenanigans as an anti-artifact card, but given the proliferation of affinity, it seems likely that Gorilla Shaman is still going to be better than that. See, that that I disagree with, actually. Um, I think that any deck looking to improve... Or sorry, any red deck looking to improve its affinity matchup needs to run a split between Gorilla Shaman and Shenanigans as Gorilla Shaman increases in value as the game progresses, right? Some players make the mistake of running it out turn one as Gorilla Shaman is actually a, a four drop in my experience. It comes down on turn four and starts eating a bunch of stuff at once and that's where it's going to make the most impact is having the potential to be a, a four for one should they kill it you got three lands out of the deal shenanigans is incredible in the early game affinity literally and i don't mean this the way some people use the word literally where they mean figuratively i mean actually literally cannot win if you start with shenanigans in your opening hand and cast it on turn two as land destruction dredging it every turn, and hitting just lands incessantly. Even if they have a couple Dark Steel Citadels and a Springleaf Drum or a Prophetic Prism, you know, they're, they're just so hindered and so bottlenecked throughout the game that uh, they cannot win versus a turn two shenanigans. So I think that as the game progresses, that's not true. You know, a turn seven shenanigans isn't going to do anything that's effective against Affinity other than maybe kill a Mirror Enforcer. So, mm -hmm. well, a lot of decks have trouble with Mirror Enforcer. Mirror Enforcer is a pretty beefy guy, and I can see having um, a split there. And if you have a split, maybe you want to bring in the shenanigans just to try to steal a, a kill on a map or maybe delay their ornament. Um, but it's really not going to be, I can't beat Tron. I'll add more shenanigans to my deck. It's really something that you have them already. You might as well bring them in and cut some more useless removal spells or whatever what i just uh, expressed about land destruction and sideboards where you may as well bring it in if you're against tron but you're not going to rely on it to actually win the game for you so this shenanigans would fall into that category as well then okay that's fair so i guess then that's not an appropriate access to attack tron is its colored sources well, it also depends on how many cards you're bringing in if you're playing boros bully and you're bringing in 11 cards already don't bring in the shenanigans. You, you really, you're just going to have a pile of nothing in your hand. You're going to blow up some artifacts. You're going to blow up some lands. And then they're going to stone horn lock you because you just cut a million cards to try to bring in all this stuff. Okay. So are there any additional misconceptions that we should cover? Or are you ready to just go on a huge tear about Bonder's Ornament? Let's just ta tackle Bonder's Ornament. Uh, let's let's start with uh, how Bonder's Ornament actually performs in Tron. Bonder's Ornament provides several additions to Tron. Uh, first, it's just extra colored sources. Um, Tron would already play like a dozen prophetic prisms if it could, and Ornament can both masquerade as a prism in a lot of draws, and it can be better than prism if the game goes for a few more turns. It also is flood protection. With an ornament out, you can just feed it four mana a turn, and you will certainly outcard your opponent if you're just drawing several cards a turn. If you draw a bunch of spells, you just get to run your spells into the opponent's cards, and you'll bury them in card advantage. If you draw more lands and other mana producers, you just keep playing them, and eventually you'll draw more spells. For instance, draw another ornament, so you're drawing three cards a turn, or draw some mold drifters and just start chaining those the ability to survive a flood and survive the hands where you have a bunch of tron lands and no colored mana means that ornament is especially potent in tron because it takes care of tron's two biggest weaknesses flooding and not having colored mana and the immediate mana production that ornament can can provide you 
is extremely strong compared to a filter effect. Turn 3 Tron Prism Mole Drifter was already the dream hand, and because Ornament just makes colored mana instead of filtering it, you're able to just go Tron Ornament Mole Drifter, which is very convenient so you're able to do that line even though ornament costs one more than prism uh and even when you blank on tron if you just go turn three ornament turn four drifter from just the ramp provided by ornament or you're able to go evoke a mole drifter and ephemerate it because you've got a a colored mana source that you can tap in the ornament or you're able to go evoke a mole drifter and then Moments Piece, because you've got a, a gain land or an island to evoke the Mole Drifter, and then you can make green mana from the ornament. Or you can go Stonehorn and hold up Ephemerate if the opponent tries to journey to nowhere or Savage Swipe it. These are a lot of lines when you miss on Tron, but you've got a turn three ornament. That's a lot of utility from a card you already are encouraged to play to provide you more color mana sources, and flood protection. Um, in addition, Ornament greatly swings certain matchups in Tron's favor. Any blue control deck now has to deal with Tron just having four must counter threats. And given Ornament's only cost three mana, it's very difficult for them to always have a way to stop it from landing, or stop them from setting up Ornament plus a counter to defend it. It means that games where a Delver deck can counter Tron's Prism and just hope that they never draw another way to make red mana is also much less likely now. And, and <laughs> the, the only saving grace is that Tron is like impossible for most people to actually play fast enough on Magic Online without racking up timeouts because of MTGO, MTGO's clunky UI, lack of ability to stack triggers and save auto yes choices like you can save auto yields, and the the increasing client lag. Magic Online's client is lagging more and more, noticeably more and more, as time goes on, which prevents people from finishing a match of Tron without timing out if they're not able to play at lightning speed. All of those barriers, in addition to a huge financial barrier on top of all of that, is one way that Tron might not get banned. Even though Ornament makes Tron that much better, and even though it was already the best deck, Ornament might make Tron less likely to get banned, because Tron players are already just kind of moving off the format or switching to a different deck, rather than just keep on grinding with Tron. And few new players are going to move on to Tron, given the fact that it's really avoid it really difficult to avoid timing out. And if you add on to that, having to drop 120 or 130 tickets just to try the deck, it seems like that's going to reduce the amount of Tron in the metagame, even if it makes the deck that much better. Maybe having the format's version of Cobblade, j just a deck that's head and shoulders above and better than everything around it, might attract like the non-popper MTGO grinders uh, from other formats to just jump in and abuse ornament tron while they can but it seems more likely that there's just going to be three four five tron players with ornaments racking up wins and not actually establishing a huge metagame share and that makes me fearful that somehow tron is going to stay legal and ornament's going to stay legal in popper and that would be a huge bummer so last time you were on the podcast, you had sort of a lengthy list of which you thought should be banned in Popper. Have you reassessed any of those, or have you just added Bonner's Ornaments to this list? I don't think Bonner's Ornaments should be banned. It's not powerful enough in non-Tron decks. If you ban Tron, Bonner's Ornaments seems like a fine card to keep around. Assuming you don't want to go just complete uh, Hatchet Man on the entire format. Like, like compare Bonner's Ornament to Monarch. You actually have to put resources in to the Bonder's Ornament to continue to draw cards every turn. With Monarch, you just say, okay, I'm going to slam my Monarch down. Can you take it? No? Okay, now I'm going to use all my mana to start killing all your stuff while keep drawing a card every turn. At least with Bonder's Ornament, you have to commit to the, uh, to the effect. Yeah, but your, your opponent can't take it away from you by attacking you with a creature. 
Yeah, they can. They can just play shenanigans. Or they can play their own ornament. Sure, which is actually a really weird clause on the ornaments. Very strange clause. And I think it's for the best. Because I do think that may be a good enough reason to let this card stick around for the long term. Again, it's problematic in Tron. We can both agree it's problematic in Tron. If you were to remove the Tron lands from the metagame, then Moner's ornaments it may actually be a non-issue because of that phrasing. That if you also, if your opponent has Bonders ornaments, you don't really want to use your Bonders ornament. So that clause is very, very important. Yeah, I would be interested in seeing like the Jess guy uh, ornament decks versus the Boros Monarch decks versus the Black X Monarch decks. See which grindy deck comes out on top, or if they all work in cohesion, if the only ban is the Tron Lands. It would be interesting to see, though I can see Bonder's Ornament being a problem. But it's not so much a problem right now, and it's not so obvious that it would be a problem if Tron was banned, to just say, okay, it goes on the list, get rid of it. So that's my rant about Ornament. We'll just have to see what the future brings for Bonder's Ornament, not just in terms of accessibility, but also just in terms of how much it really changes the formats, as well as, you know, we'll just have to see what happens with Tron, because I know that you were previously on the the podcast about 30 episodes ago, and you really wanted Tron to be banned at that time. So, should you be back on in, say, another 30 episodes, I hope that you can have your way. I hope they don't make you wait years and years and years to get your wish, especially when you've been putting in all the work trying to get it banned. But let's go ahead and transition into our weekly segments. Traditionally, we do a segment called Play of the Day, but we're talking about a whole handful of tournaments that you've done very well in. Out of those tournaments, is there one unique, sweet play that sticks out above the rest? Yeah, in this previous one I won, I abused ornament to brutalize my opponent. I was on the play. I went turn one tower. My opponent went uh, turn one windscarred crag, the red-white gain land. My turn two was mine. So they're already having a bad time. Oh, yeah. Boros decks do not want to see Tron. My turn two play was mine into prism. Their turn two play was bounce land. No threat, just bounce land. Turn three, they played a or I played a Cave of Temptation, and then cast Compulsive Research on myself, finding Tron. Uh, their turn three play was Replay the Gain Land, Seeker of the Way. On my turn four, I went Plant to have Tron. Ornament, Dinner of a Horror. I had enough mana, because Ornament just makes the black mana. And then I filtered through the plant, the prism, to have the blue mana. I horrored back their Bounce Land. So the board state was, they have a tapped gain land, a seeker of the way, against my board of mine, tower, plant, prism, ornament, cave, and in river horror. And I still had like seven cards in hand. And I had an active ornament. They conceded two turns later. That sounds like a late concession, honestly. I think I would have scooped it up right away. They did their best. They, re- they played a second seeker by playing a basic land, and then they saw what card they drew, and then they conceded. I guess if you have two Seekers, you got to hold out a little bit of hope, but I don't think I've ever not conceded to an aggressive horror hitting my bounce land. It's hard to come back from that. It's also just so soul-crushing as the bounce land deck, because when you see your opening hand, that's what you want to see as a bounce land. You love it. You're like, oh, yeah, cool, keep. And then they just use it against you. Just turn turn it right on, right around on you. And if you don't have any more lands to play, would you like to replay your bounce land when I have a horror in, on on the battlefield? That's really the worst. The worst feeling is when you have to replay the bounce land. And you're just like, I, I hope he doesn't have it. But don't have teachings. Don't have flicker. Don't have ephemerate. Don't have another horror. It's tough when it isn't just one copy of one card, but it's like twelve. And you're already behind because you just lost two dro- two land drops. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty brutal. Pretty brutal play you've got there. So how about Silly Sliver's abilities? What sort of Silly Sliver ability do you have to share with us? Well, I was thinking you could have a JM Day Sliver. All Slivers gain four, tap, 
draw a card. See, the combo is you play a gem height sliver, and then all of your slivers are now bonder slivers. They can both tap for a mana of any color, or pay for a mana, tap, draw a card. Yeah, I'd imagine that might get pretty silly, but only because the slivers wouldn't be attacking in large groups as they traditionally do, and instead are choosing to just willingly dirtle. So that, that in itself would be rather silly of them. Well, you gotta get some vigilant sliver in there. In response to attacking for lethal, I draw three cards. Yeah, of course. I'll, I'll deal you 37, but first... Really gotta send that message, you know? It always helps. My silly slivers ability this week. All slivers have deja vu. It's almost like they've seen this episode before with Tron winning and all. Thanks so much for coming back on the podcast. A pleasure as always, and I can only imagine that we'll hear from you again in the future, considering you just routinely win the challenge. That does help. Hopefully I'll be a champion soon enough. And thanks once more to my guest for coming on the podcast. In the short time that we took to edit this podcast, Halsa made three more top eights in the challenge with Tron and has successfully tested out Thriving Isle. He currently runs four of them, and while we did discuss his inclusion of Last Breath as a very interesting removal spell in his main deck, it is now a Lightning Bolt. He doesn't play Tranquil Coves anymore. He has Thriving Isles. It's going to choose red some percentage of the time, post-board anyway, for red elemental blasts. But some of the times, that Thriving Isle will also be choosing red now in his main deck to have access to Lightning Bolt for all the very same reasons he described wanting access to Last Breath. It's a cheaper, more efficient removal spell. Something which I had forgotten to discuss with him was the suffocating fumes that he has in his main deck. It's playing the role that many players have chosen to use Electricery for while benefiting from not being able to be countered by Blue Elemental Blast, as well as being able to cycle itself should it be a dead draw in Game 1. Not often do we get footnotes in the outro, but of course it's not often that someone goes on a run like Helsa has, truly redefining what it means to be on a heater with that many top 8s in a row. Not very often does somebody finding so much success want their tools to be taken away. Really interesting. It's not a discussion commonly heard in this game, but one I was glad to have. But like those slivers, I have seen this episode before quite frequently. In fact, we've had Tron pilots on the podcast. I think we're rapidly approaching double digits for number of episodes with Tron pilots, which is simply too frequently. This is not me commenting on the state of Pomper, but rather commenting on the state of my content. Moving forward, I'm going to make an effort to speak with fewer Tron pilots so that we can discuss decks that I have fresh questions for, that I want to learn about. I feel like the Tron story has been captured. Even though they have these beautiful new tools to work with, the main discussion has been done at this point to death. So, moving forward, I'm going to be keeping my eyes out for archetypes that I've yet to discuss in detail with a guest that do well in the challenge. There's decks that have been around in Popper for longer than I have that we've yet to hear from. A deck like Affinity, a deck like Elves. Realistically, it's just a matter of time before these decks do well and I can have such discussions. Coming up on the podcast, a discussion with a Blue Red Delver pilot the winner of the showcase, a previous Poppergaden champion, we're going to learn just a little bit about a deck we have yet to hear from, and I'm looking forward to bringing that conversation with you, so please do join me, and I'll see you then.